before we talk about the future, let's talk about the past, the assembly theory. Yeah. Can you uh, explain assembly theory to me? I listened to Lee talk about it for many hours and I understood nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to take another, pers- well, you've been already talking about it, but just, yeah. just, just, another, just what from a big picture view is the assembly theory way of thinking about our world? Bar our universe. Yeah. I think the uh, first thing is, you know, that like the observation that uh, life seems to be the only thing in the universe that builds complexity in the way that we see it here. And complexity is obviously like a loaded term. So I'll just use assembly instead because uh, I think assembly is more precise. Um, but the idea that like, you know, all the things on your desk here from your computer to the pen to, uh, you know, us sitting here don't exist anywhere else in the universe as far as we know. They only exist on this planet. And it took a long evolutionary history to get to us um, is a real feature that we should take seriously as one that's deeply embedded in the laws of physics and the structure of the universe that we live in. Uh, Standard physics would say that, you know, all of that complexity traces back to the infinitesimal uh, deviations and like the initial state of the universe that there was some order there. Um, I find that deeply unsatisfactory. And uh, what assembly theory says uh, that's very different is that the universe is basically constructing itself. And when you get to these combinatorial spaces like chemistry, uh, where the space of possibilities is too large to exhaust them all, Um, you can only construct things along historically contingent paths. Like you basically have causal chains of events that happen to allow other things to come into existence. And, uh, And that this is the way that complex objects get formed is basically on scaffolding on the past history of objects making more complex objects, making more complex objects. That idea in itself is easy to state and simple, but it has some really radical implications as far as what you think um, is the nature of the physics that would describe life. And so what assembly theory does formally is try to measure the boundary um, in the space of all things that, you know, chemically could exist, for example, like all possible molecules. Where is the boundary above which we should say these things are too complex to happen outside of an evolutionary chain of events, outside of selection? Um, and we formalize that um, with two observables. One of them is the copy number of the object. So how many of the object did you observe? And the second one is what's the minimal number of recursive steps to make it? So if you start from elementary building blocks like bonds for molecules and you put them together and then you take things you've made already and build up to the object, what's the shortest number of steps you had to take? And what Lee's been able to show in the lab with his team is that for organic chemistry, uh, it's about 15 steps. And then you only see molecules uh, that, you know, the only molecules that we observe that are past that threshold are ones that are are in life. And in fact, one of the things I'm trying to do with this idea of like trying to actually quantify the original life as a transition in uh, like a phase transition assembly theory is actually be able to um, explain why that boundary is where it is. Because I think that's actually the boundary that life must cross. So the idea of going back to this thing we were talking about before about these these structures that can reinforce their own existence and move past that boundary, uh, 15 seems to be that boundary in chemical space. Uh, It's not a universal number. It will be different for different assembly spaces. Um, but that's what we've experimentally validated so far. And then... So literally 15, like the assembly index is 15? It's 15 assemb- or so for the experimental data, yeah. So that's when you start getting the self-reinforcing. That's when you have to have that feature in order for to observe molecules in high abundance in that space. So the copy number is the, the number of exact copies. Well, that's what you mean by high abundance. And assembly yeah. index or the complexity of the object is how many steps it took to create it, recursive. Recursive, yeah. So you can think of objects in assembly theory as basically recursive stacks of the the construction steps to build them. 
So they're like, it's like I you take this step and then you make this object and you make it this object and make this object and then you get up to the final object. But that object is all of that history rolled up into the current structure. What if you took the long way home? You can't goes. take the long way. Why not? The long way doesn't exist. It's a good song though. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean the long way doesn't exist? If I do, um, if I do a random walk from A to B, I'll eventually, if I start at A, I'll eventually end up at B. And that random so walk would be much shorter than the, out, longer than the short. No, if you look at objects and you, you so the, the we we define something we call the assembly universe, and the assembly universe is ordered in time. It's actually ordered in, in the causation, the number of steps to produce an object, and so all objects in the universe are in some sense um, exist at a layer that's defined by their assembly index, um, and the size of each layer is growing exponentially. So what you're talking about, if you want to look at the long way of getting to an object, as I'm increasing the assembly index of an object, I'm moving deeper and deeper into an exponentially growing space. And it's actually also the case that the sort of typical path to get to that object is also exponentially growing with respect to the assembly index. And so if you want to try to make a more and more complex object and you want to do it by a, a, a typical path, that's actually an exponentially receding horizon. And so most objects that come into existence have to be causally very similar to the things that exist because they're close by in that space and they can actually get to it by an almost shortest path for that object. Yeah, the, the almost shortest path is the most likely and, yeah. and like by a lot. By a lot. Okay, so if you see, see a high copy number. Yeah, imagine copy yourself- number yeah. greater than one. Yeah, I mean, basically we live, the more complex we get, we live in a, a, a space that is growing exponentially large and the the ways of getting to objects in the space are also growing exponentially large and so we're this kind of uh recursively like stacked structure of like all of these objects that are clinging onto each other <laughs> for existence and then they like grab something else and are allowed uh, like able to bring that thing into existence because it's kind of similar to them but there is a phase transition. There is a there is a transition. There is a place where you would say, "Oh, that's I think it's life. actually abrupt." I've never been able to say that in in my entire career before. I've always gone back and forth about whether the origin of life was kind of gradual or abrupt. I think it's very abrupt. Uh, poetically, life snaps chemically, into existence. Literally, what snaps? Okay, that's very it beautiful. snaps. Okay, but we'll be poetic today. But no, I think there's like a lot of random exploration, and then there's a, like, and then the structure, the possibility space, just collapses on the structure kind of really fast. Um, that can reinforce its own existence because it's basically fighting against non-existence. Yeah, you uh, tweeted the most significant <laughs> struggle for existence in the evolutionary process is not among the objects that do exist, but between the ones that do and those that never have the chance to. Yeah. This is where selection does most of its ca causal work. The, <laughs> the <laughs> objects that never get a chance to exist. Yeah. The struggle between the ones that never get a chance to exist and the ones that, okay. what What's that line exactly? I don't know. We can make songs out of all of these. What no. are the objects that never get a chance to exist? What does that mean? So there was there was this uh, website. I forgot what it was, but it's like it's like a a neural network that just generates a human face, and it's yep. like this person does not exist. I think that's what it's called, right? So you can just click on that all day, and you can look at people all day that don't exist. Yeah, all of those people exist in that space of things that don't exist. Yeah, but there's a uh, the real struggle. Yeah, so the struggle uh, of the quote, the struggle of it for existence is, you know, that goes all the way back to Darwin's writing about natural selection, right? So like the whole idea of survival of the fittest is everything struggling to exist, this predator-prey dynamic, um, and, and the fittest survive. And so the struggle for existence is really what selection is all about. But you're, and that's true. Uh, we do see things that do exist competing to continue to exist. Um, but each time that, like, if you think about this space of possibilities and, you know, each time the universe, you know, generates a new structure or like a, an, an object that exists generates a new structure along this causal chain, it's generating something that exists that never existed before. And each time that we make that kind of decision, we're excluding a huge space of possibilities. And so actually like as this process of increasing assembly index, it's not just that like the space that these objects exist in is exponentially growing, but there are, there are objects in that space 
that are exponentially receding away from us. So they're becoming exponentially less and less likely to ever exist. And so existence excludes a huge number of things. Just because of the accident of history, how it ended up. Yeah, it's, it, it is in part an accident because I think I think some of the, the structure that gets generated is, is driven a bit by randomness. Um, I think a lot of it, you know, so... Uh, you know, one of the conceptions that we have in assembly theory is, you know, the universe is random at its base. You can see this in chemistry, like unconstrained chemical reactions are pretty random. Uh, and then, and also quantum mechanics, you know, like there's lots of places that that give evidence for that. Um, and deterministic structures emerge by things that can causally reinforce themselves and maintain persistence over time. And so, we are some of the most deterministic things in the universe. And so, like, we can generate very regular structure and we can generate new structure along a particular lineage. But the possibility space at the sort of tips, like the things we can generate next, is really huge. So there's some stochasticity in what we actually, you know, instantiate as, like, the next structures that get built in in the biosphere. Um, it's not completely ter- deterministic because the space of future possibilities is always larger than the space of things that exist now. So how many instantiations of life is out there, do you think? Uh, <laughs> so how how often does this happen? What we see happen here on Earth? How often is this process repeated throughout our galaxy, throughout the universe? So I, I said before, like right now, I think the origin of life is a continuous process on Earth. Like I think this this idea of like combinatorial spaces that our biosphere generates, not just chemistry, but other spaces, um, often cross this threshold where they then allow themselves to persist with a particular regular structure over time. So language is, is another one where, you know, like the space of, you know, possible configurations of the 26 letters of the English alphabet is astronomically large, but we use with very high regularity certain structures. Um, And then we associate meaning to them because of the regularity of like how much we use them, right? So meaning is an emergent property of the causation and the objects and like how often they recur and, and what the relationship of the recurrence is to other objects. Meaning is the emergent property. Okay, got it. Well, this is why you can play with language so much, actually. So words don't really carry meaning. It's just about how you lace them together. Yeah, but from from where does the But you you don't have a lot of room. Obviously, as as a speaker of a given language, you don't have a lot of room with a given word to wiggle, but you do have you do have you have a certain amount of room to push the meanings of words. Yeah. And um and I do this all the time and you have to do it. Uh, with the kind of work that I do, because if you want to uh, discover an abstraction, like some kind of concept that we don't understand yet, we it means we don't have the language. And so the you words that wiggle. we have are inadequate to describe the things. This is why we're having a hard time talking about assembly theory, because it's a newly emerging idea. Um, and so, um, so I'm constantly playing with words in different ways to try to convey the meaning that is actually behind the words, but it's hard to do so you have to wiggle within the constraints yes lots of wiggle the uh <laughs> the great orators are, are, are just good at wiggling <laughs> do you wiggle <laughs> i'm not a very good wiggler no this is the problem this is part of the problem no i like playing with words a lot um you know it's very funny because you know like I, I i know you talked about this with lee but like people are so offended by the writing of uh the paper that came out last fall and it was it was interesting because the ways that we use were, were words were not the way that people were interacting with the words. Um, and I think that was part of the mismatch where we were trying to use words in a new way because we were trying to describe something that, uh, you know, hadn't been described adequately before, but we had to use the words that everyone else uses for things that are related. And so it was really interesting to watch that clash play out in real time for me, being someone that tries to be so precise with my word usage, knowing that it's always going to be vague. Boy, can I relate. It's (laughs) like, uh, what is truth? Is truth the thing you meant when you wrote the words, or is truth the thing that people understood when they read the words? Oh, yeah. I I think uh, that compression mechanism into language is a really interesting one, and that's why... Twitter is a nice exercise. I you love get, Twitter. Yeah, you get to reason. write a thing and you think a certain thing when you write it. And then you get to see all these other people interpret it in all yeah, kinds yeah. of different ways. I use it as an experimental platform for that reason. 
I wish there was a higher diversity of interpretation mechanisms applied to tweets, meaning like oh. all kinds of different people would come to it. Like some people that see the good in everything and some people that are ultra cynical, a bunch yeah. of haters and a bunch of lovers and a bunch Maybe of- Maybe they could do better jobs with presenting material to people. Like, you know, the the rant, like like how things, you know, it's like usually based on interest, but I think it would be really nice if you got like 10% of your Twitter feed was random stuff sampled from other places. That'd be kind of fun. True. <laughs> I also would love to filter just like bin uh, the response to tweets by like the people that hate on everything. Yes. The people that are- Oh, that would be fantastic. The people that are like super positive about everything. And that it, they'll just kind of- I guess normalize the response because yeah. then it'd be cool to see if the people that are usually positive about everything are hating on you or like totally don't understand or completely misunderstood. Yeah. Usually it takes a lot of clicking to find that out. Yeah. yeah so it'd be more, better if it was sorted. Yeah. The more clicking you do, <laughs> the more damaging it is to the soul. Yeah. It's like instead of like, well, you can have the blue check, but you should have like, are you a pessimist, an optimist, yeah, there's a <laughs> chaotic lot of neutral? <laughs> What's your, yeah, what's your whole what's your rainbow of checks? <laughs> and then you realize there's more categories than we can possibly express in colors. Yeah, of course. Uh, People are complex. <laughs> That's our best feature. <laughs>